Um, and then you have other groups who say, well, okay, I, I, you know, I'll, take, I'll take something, it's better than nothing. I want to be in the room and make that decision. As a sponsor of the bill, we were somewhere between there. As a sponsor of the bill, we were saying, we fully back this bill. And it also meant that we were in that room. Um, and we were part of the decision-making process. We were not only consulted, but we were included fully in the decision-making process about what to do after that crucial education committee hearing. And I remember being there. Said, okay, so, oh my God, what do we do now? Uh, we have a week to fix this. Um, what are the real concerns from the various legislators who've expressed them? And how do we address them without compromising our core goal? Um, so we kept going back to our stated goal, which was to increase the vaccination rates in the state of California to the point where we would again have community immunity. It was never to forcibly vaccinate every child in the state. It was to bring the community immunity up to the level where those children, those people, because there are adults too, who cannot be vaccinated, who are not protected on their own from preventable diseases so that they would have the protection of their neighbors. So that was our goal, and we kept revisiting that, and when we were in that room, that's what we kept striving for, and I think that's what we achieved. So as the parent voice, what we did, um, what, what we were able to do was we got um, support letters from every single county in the state. We were not just a group of six moms or eight moms and a few others. We were uh, ultimately thousands of people across the state, and we had written letters, with a stack of letters in the box, ready to deliver to the governor to say, sign the bill, and then we found out he'd already signed it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we had hundreds of calls, we generated hundreds of phone calls into legislators in the governor's office, um, and we had people <coughs> ready and willing to speak at um, meetings about the bill in uh, various county uh, board of supervisors meetings and school board meetings across the state um, as they considered endorsing the bill. Um, so uh, an, a key piece, so that's how we came to be and what we are about and then how did we really work with the rest of the coalition? Because we, Vaccinate California, were not an established entity. We didn't exist prior to February. It wasn't a phrase, right? Um, but we had partnerships with entities that are long-standing voices in this space. We worked very closely with the California Medical Association, the California Immunization Coalition, the School Nurses Organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the um, uh, PTA, the Parent Teachers Association and Organization. And they, because they have the relationships and the long-standing presence in Sacramento, they were able to visit with every legislative office. And they were able to talk to every legislative office and explain in detail why this bill was good public policy from a medical standpoint, from a public policy standpoint. Um, so they had school, school officials and public health officials making all of those meetings. What we did um, was get phone calls in from constituents to say, yes, it's good policy, and we, your constituents, want this bill to pass. Um, also, while the other groups had uh, some other bills to work on, you know, there were a few other things happening in Sacramento this past summer, our organization had one focus. We focused almost exclusively on SB 277. It was one other bill involving vaccinations that we worked on too, but primarily we were focused on this bill, and that meant that we really, really could <coughs> leverage every last ounce of energy and time that our volunteers had to move this bill forward and to reach those like-minded individuals who sort of thought, as I did before I had a child, that this issue was taken care of, that our, our laws you know, brought us into the first world and um, protected us from vaccine-preventable diseases, and get them to realize that that wasn't the case, not that they weren't because of the measles headlines, but get them to advocate for the bill. We showed them how, we made it easy for them to do it, um, and we plugged them into the process. So how did we show our support? We, uh, among other things, after every vote, we delivered a thank you note and cookies to every legislator who voted yes. We hand delivered that, and we worked with um, the Senate offices and some of the Sacramento-based teams to do that. Those are, um, I think, uh, either nursing students or um, pharma pharmaceutical students who made those rounds, pharmacy students, who made those rounds, uh, along with some of our moms, um, to deliver cookies saying thank you. Uh, we emailed out lists of phone numbers for the legislative offices. Uh, in the days and weeks before every vote so that people who had some time to make a phone call knew what number to call to be most effective with their five minutes. 
Um, we made it very easy for people to send a letter of support. We had a form on our website, um, and then we hand delivered those letters. Uh, we worked with Dr. Pan's staff to make sure that when those letters were delivered, uh, the legislator staff knew what they were and could pay attention to them and just go into the trash. Um, so we were able to get constituents to call legislators and confirm for them that this was what they wanted. And that was important because we learned that a lot of legislators knew this was the right thing. And they knew that, um, that it, it, it was good public policy and I think they wanted to vote for the bill. But the opposition was loud. And so being able to provide for them confirmation that it was the right thing to do and that their constituency wanted it was indeed key. The other thing was we did, that we did was we worked to get other organizations to endorse the bill and to utilize their membership lists to get their membership to call. Uh, we worked closely with the Sacramento-based team to do that. We reached out to uh, a whole number of organizations and um, by the end, this was our endorsement list. And this is incredibly impressive. This was over just a few months. We had endorsements from almost every newspaper, every major newspaper in the state. We had organ, uh, endorsements from uh, business groups, from education groups. Uh, so we had commitments from um, every sector of the economy and every sector of uh, just the public community that this was a bill that they supported. And they were emailing out their membership saying, you need to be calling your legislators now and telling them to support this bill. That was key. Um, so I'm, I'm, we are, are really proud of that list. Uh, another thing that was really important for us was that our message remained very much on the positive and why this bill was important. And you see right here, this is, this is my son, and in the audience we have his sister and his mother. <laughs> and um, Gideon is, is local, obviously. <laughs> um, Gideon is medically fragile. He had to be delayed on his vaccines because he was not able to be vaccinated on time. And even despite having received his vaccines, he remains medically fragile, which means that his immunity is never going to be as strong as the rest of ours. So he still relies on the rest of us to protect him. So despite receiving the flu vaccine last year, which wasn't that great a vaccine to begin with, whole other topic, he got the flu. Uh, he was one of those that got the flu, and he's still a very small child. So SB 277 had to pass for school to become a reality for Gideon. Um, so one of the things we did was we found people, or they found us, with stories like Gideon's and helped them tell their story in a way where legislators would hear it. Um, and we got them to the media when the media wanted to talk to somebody with a compelling story. So we were able to get those stories out um, again, to put a face on why this bill was necessary, other than a white lab coat and a stethoscope. A parent or a child saying, we need this bill to pass. Um, so uh, we kept our voice positive, we kept our, our stories um, affirmative, and we um, made sure that legislators knew who they would be protecting if they voted yes to support the bill. So on that, um, a quick note about the opposition which was, as we've talked about, very, very vocal. Um, and they showed up. They showed up in force uh, at every hearing. Um, and it was um, personally uh, sometimes intimidating. Um, I remember actually having some tears of stress relief as I was ushered by security out of the Judiciary Committee hearing after testifying. Um, but what, what was really important in terms of our messaging and our thinking about how to move this bill forward and what to do next is to remember that um, they're parents too. And they love and support their kids uh, very, very much, strongly and fiercely, just as we do. So my motivation for fighting for this bill was the same as theirs for fighting against it. They believe wrongly that the vaccines are dangerous. I believe, based in science and evidence, that vaccines are what will protect my child from what is even more dangerous. Um, so they're just doing what we are. They're just doing their level best to protect their kids. And that is respectable. Um, frustrating, but respectable. <coughs> so uh, what we did, again, keeping our, our voice positive, we didn't get into the trenches with the opposition talking about um, you know, do vaccines cause autism? We left that to medical professionals because ultimately the reason we're in this is because we trust the medical professionals. 
Um, but we did correct misunderstandings about the bill and how it would work. Um, we explained the homeschooling <coughs> option. We explained um, what the medical exemption means and, and how to obtain it. Um, we ex explained the quote unquote grandfathering clause, how this bill will be rolled in as children um, age into the school system and each checkpoint. Uh, we try to make sure, we tried during passage as well as now, to make sure that people understand nobody's going to show up at homes with syringes and vaccinate children against their parents' will. That's simply not what the bill was ever about, nor is it what's going to happen. Um, but we knew we were not going to win by getting into the trenches. We were going to win by showing the legislators and the governor that the majority of parents want this bill. So and at the end of the day, that one. <laughs> so at the end of the day, the bill became law. Um, moms and dads demanded change and better protection for their children and communities, and we got it, uh, thanks to the hard work of many, many citizens and many, many legislators. Um, so what's next for us? Um, next, is that my slide? Yes. Okay. What's next for us? Um, we're here, we're promoting public health, promoting immunization efforts, uh, continuing to work with the connections that we've made, uh, brainstorming um, how to uh, implement the bill, how to educate people about the bill, um, and uh, we're supporting those that voted, voted for the bill. So one of the people who worked closely in the Vaccinate California leadership is working against the um, recall for Dr. Pan, which we hope will not succeed because we need him in office. Uh, we are continuing to support um, other legislators who worked hard on the bill, like uh, Bill Monning and um, Lorena Gonzalez and Ben Allen. Um, all these people who stood up for our kids were now standing up for them. Uh, so we're, we continue to think it's important to engage in the public debate, and we continue to think it's important that that debate reflect the truth. Uh, that vaccines are a public good and the major majority of parents want them for everybody. So, uh, with that, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was uh, very inspiring. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Renee DeResta. She is also a volunteer. Uh, we also work with Vaccinate California. Um, but she's also a mother, writer, and data enthusiast. And so she used her passion for data and uh, her skills in writing to uh, produce a piece of analysis that was published in Wired Magazine. And I think it came along at a critical moment in the uh, while the legislature was considering SB 277. So Renee, take it away. Hi everybody, thank you for, uh, for having me. I just got off a plane, I'm trying to get situated. It's nine o'clock in my time right now. Um, let's see. So I think Dr. Penn and Leah did a really great uh, job explaining sort of the more traditional uh, legislative and policy methods for getting a bill through. And what I want to talk to you about is actually what is happening on the internet today, how that's shaping public policy, and how that turns all of you into advocates, um, whether you kind of necessarily want to be or not. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how information is transmitted. So there's like a little tiny bit of math here to start with. Um, so if you look at this, we can pretend that this is a small town, and this is the sum total of all of the people in the small town. Show of hands here, any of you guys are, this is a college. How many of you are taking graph theory or any of ones? Okay. All right. So <laughs> I did computer science undergrad, so this was like a whole, you know, whole semester. But um, <laughs> yeah. So you can see that there's a minority of blue circles, but they're incredibly well connected. You can see the lines coming off of the nodes. And then you can see that there's a majority of orange circles, but they're not necessarily as well connected, and they're actually not really well connected to each other. So this concept illustrates the phenomenon by which something that is not necessarily a majority opinion can feel like a majority opinion depending on whether or not you're existing in kind of an echo chamber. You, know, you may have heard this talked about on social media in terms of um, the filter bubble. What you think is true is, uh, is likely, uh, there's a great degree of overlap with what your neighbors think is true, what your friend group thinks is true. So this is kind of phenomenon number one. And then phenomenon number two is what we call a zero cost publishing. And this is something where, uh, this is not math, this is just on the internet, um, all of a sudden everybody has a megaphone. We're all equal on the internet. We can all start a blog tomorrow. You can go and you can write whatever you want and you can put it out there on the internet and whether it is true or not, uh, it doesn't matter because this is, you know, you're exercising your first amendment right. 
But what used to happen is that in order to be published, there were these gatekeepers. So if you think about traditional media, you think about newspapers maybe, or you're thinking about um, what you see you know, on TV. There's a lot of debates about bias in media, but ultimately fact checking was something that you know, a fact is a fact, and then kind of like the old days, right? <laughs> so then, social media came along. And I'm going to talk mostly about Twitter because it's a really great way to visualize the type of network that I was talking about in the beginning. And Twitter's fascinating because Facebook, when you join, you find your friends. Twitter, when you join, you, maybe you find your friends if you're in San Francisco or the Bay Area, right? But if you're, uh, if you're not, or if you're not part of like the millennials or whatever, uh, probably you're not going to find your friends. You're going to use it more as a means of consuming media. And so what you're going to find on there is you're maybe going to go looking for hashtags. Um, you're going to go looking for your tribe. And you're not necessarily going to do this follow or follow relationship, but it's a really great way to get real-time news, like up to the minute, something happens, the plane crashes, Who's on it? Journalists are on it. They're telling you everything that's happening. It's being updated much faster than the web. It's being updated much faster than TV. And the side effect of that is that there's no fact checking happening while this is going on. So this is sort of this like digital fog of war where there's all of this information, and it's really fantastic because you can kind of capture it and digest it, but you don't really know whether it's true. All right. So Twitter and social media in general is it's kind of a, a marketer's dream because you can get there, you can find your people, and you can target them really carefully. Show of hands here, has anybody ever run a Facebook ad campaign for anything or grown a student group or something? Guy who's a graph theory? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So, yeah. so the point is, you can you think about people in terms of like segmented buckets, and they have certain traits, and that's how the internet, that's how advertisers see you, that's how content producers see you, that's how even if you think that you're reading like the crunchiest of crunchy mom blogs, they are still out there and they are still targeting. So the net effect of kind of these things, these tight communities, the zero cost publishing, the ability to have amplification and virality instantaneously no matter who you are, uh, has resulted in this, which is that the power to influence opinions increasingly lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message. So this is the real power of social media. So one small group, the corollary to this, is that one small well-connected group, like those blue dots in the first graph, who have the means of transmission, think of a celebrity maybe, think of Jenny McCarthy perhaps, <laughs> um, can have a disproportionate impact on public sentiment. So diving right in, um, this is a slide from what I wrote about in Wired. Um, I spend a lot of time, I'm really interested in network dynamics, I work in tech, I have a startup, you know, all these, these like, computer science, right, all these things. Um, and I was interested actually in, could you get a handle on what the network was saying, how the network was evolving, and what could that tell us about advocacy and how to be effective advocates. So Leah and you know, kind of one side of the Vaccine California House was working on coalition building, engagement, finding people, finding stories, finding narratives. And what I was doing was I was looking at data. <laughs> so, which is just, it's uh, honestly, it's, you know, we, we see this in any type of issue campaign. This is basically the future of issue campaigns. This is the future of presidential campaigns. Uh, this is the future, it, it's actually the present of advertising, and so politics is just kind of catching up to some extent. Um, so I worked with a great data scientist out of uh, Betaworks, uh, Bill out of town. He helped me uh, with this project. And we looked at what we called <laughs> mapping the sphere. Which was actually, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not very PC, but that was my, my term for it anyway. Um, so we started with anti-vaxxers, but what I was more interested in was how do, how do fringe groups on the internet communicate with each other? Because you have to propagate your message, because otherwise you're just screaming into an echo chamber. So anytime you're trying to get something done, be it coalition building or getting people to like, you know, your club event or whatever, you're forming these coalitions and now you're forming them digitally. So the same way we were working with, um, Health organizations and teacher organizations. Uh, this is the slightly prettier, cleaner um, version. But this was sort of, so that first thing was V1 and then this is V2. It's important to mention these graphs, they generate themselves. So you give kind of like a keyword or an initial hashtag or an initial set of users. And then from there, you can see the bigger picture. And that's the power of network visualization. So a uh, network graph is coded in a couple of different ways for those of you who haven't sat through this class. Um, large circles, that's called centrality. That's indicating how well, uh, the, the centrality of a node is to what extent its messages are amplified. So since this is Twitter, that would be, do people talk to it? Do people respond to it? Do people um, amplify its message? Are they retweeted? 
Um, the lines show direct follower following relationships. So on Twitter, that's not necessarily bi directional, meaning I can follow you, but you don't have to follow me. But this is showing the way users connect. Uh, and then the clusters by color are the topics or hashtags that particular groups of people segment themselves into. And so this is basically what we were looking at from the standpoint of who are people talking to. And this is something, if you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm what, what subgroup of Twitter? of tweets is this? Uh, this is the SB277 hashtag. Okay, so the SB277 hashtag. Hashtag SB277. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so hashtag SB277, and then from there, um, let me give you the, make sure I've explained that. Um, yeah, okay, so um, in the pink, we have anti-vaxxers. And I'll go a little bit more into what makes them anti-vaxxers. Uh, the orange is the autism community. <laughs> Um, this swab of turquoise here, that's the tea party. Um, that's the what? It's the tea, it's tea party. party. You know the far right? Far, far right? Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm going to count on a bunch of your birthday. <laughs>
who weren't previously part of it. So if your objective is to create this public groundswell, then this is a really fantastic way to do it. You've just increased your audience tenfold, and all you had to do was get the right people to be. So to your question about numbers here, um, I'm going to read these off the slide because I don't want to um, misquote. Um, by the way, that concept where we saw the small green group and then that, um, and also I should clarify, the autism group, they're not tweeting about vaccines causing autism. They're participating in the SB277 discussion. There's some overlap because of the uh, autism vaccine conspiracy theory, so you do see the autism nodes will emerge when you go looking for the um, for the anti-vax cluster. That's just how the network, uh, network orients itself. So what I want to call attention to here, though, is um, this was over a month. So what, what you see here is there's this, and you guys should all know about it from public health, um, Simpler, S-Y-M-P-L-U-R. It's a fantastic site that tracks health-related hashtags. So entirely independent of the vaccine debate, if you're ever doing a class project and you want to like, get a sense of like, the pulse of, of the health community on Twitter, particular disease, Ebola is another one, Simpler is a really great way to just go in there. And you can also see how conversations evolve over time. So by looking at Simpler, uh, we were able to get a sense of the, wane, the waxing and waning of CDC whistleblower, the CDC whistleblower people actually actively moved into the SB277. That was really the dominant hashtag for a while. So what you see here is um, top 10 by case. I will sum that up for you. It is 63,000. 10 people <coughs> sent out 63,000 of 243,000 tweets. Now, let me give you another number. 19,000 people participated in the hashtag, meaning sent out at least one tweet with that hashtag uh, over this month. So you'll see this average number of tweets per participant, they're saying it's 13. This is where the like, mean versus median kind of understanding statistics really comes into play here. What actually happened in this hashtag is that one quarter of the tweets, 25% of the activity, was from half a percent of their own coalition. So half a percent of those 19,000 people sent out 25% of the tweets that were pushed into the hashtag. So this is how we talk about what you, you may go on there and you may be like overwhelmed by this barrage of crap, but the reality is this is an incredibly small number of people. So the other stat I'll throw at you is that in any given month, there are 320 million active users on, twi on Twitter. 19,000 of them were talking about vaccines. 19,000 active vaccines. Yes? Could you explain what impressions mean? How is that different? From yeah, so an impression is um, when you open up the Twitter app, um, it's just the, if you're following somebody, it appears in your feed. So even if you don't actually read it, you just scroll past it, that counts as an impression. It's just how many people conceivably could have seen this tweet, not how many people actually looked at this tweet. So what's interesting is that when you hear um, kind of unsavvy marketers talking in impression terms, or frankly CDC whistleblower with their, we had one billion impressions, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, to, to put that in context, like five minutes of the Oscars or like like one minute of the Super Bowl is way more impressions than that. <laughs> Renee, how many um, tweets did Vaccinate California send out? And how many people sent out those tweets? Uh, I sent them out. <laughs> and how many did you send out? Probably a fraction of that because it didn't matter. So give me one more second. Okay, so. <laughs> say is that fascinating and interesting as it is for me just as somebody who really likes graph theory, um, the strategy was ineffective. And the reason for that is that one of the things they did was they would find every senator who's going to be on the committee and they would go into the secret Facebook groups where they would have, they have these weird YouTube videos that they would put out every night, which were the instructions for the troops. And it's, it's great if you're a brand strategist, you want all of your messaging like on point. So it was like, okay, room full of people, we're all going to tweet this thing at this guy with this meme, like get on it and go. And then you get those numbers up, you get that amplification up, but you know what? Nobody pays attention. Because I spoke with a number of the senators after uh, the bill passed. And I spoke with both. I spoke with, I probably, um, I didn't get permission to say their names, but I spoke with people who voted for it, and I spoke with a lot of people who voted against it. And I said, did you pay attention to Twitter? And resoundingly, the answer for most of them was, we did in the beginning, 
We were so put off by the barrage of trash, by the rape memes, by the Hitler memes, by the crap that was being like pushed at us incessantly by people that we stopped paying attention. It was a completely ineffective strategy. It did nothing for them. So when you talk about as a small organization, um, and, or if you're ever going to run an, an online marketing campaign, anybody, um, what you get at is like, what's my goal? What do I want to achieve? We needed to achieve yes votes from a majority across eight or so, um, nine votes in various committees. So it didn't matter to us if we were winning people over on Twitter. What mattered to us is, are we getting the votes? So engaging in kind of, you know, who's tweeting more wars is completely because it was bot-like behavior. Here's the thing, you're going to tweet it, you're all going to tweet it, everybody's going to tweet it, and nobody cares. You're tweeting into an echo chamber. Maybe you get the conservatives on board, but you know what, they're not in California and they can't help you. <laughs>
that one shaped up to be was sort of a classic expert versus parental anecdote, right? Mm -hmm. Parents brought in kids, and they were vaccine damaged. I had people with white coats and degrees saying that no, it's and and that that and while we were successful, uh, we realized that that um, that simply having experts there and simply trying to debunk the misinformation that was being presented. Actually, sometimes the misinformation was so extreme we didn't have to bother debunking it. Uh, it just didn't, it didn't have credibility. But I mean, that's the uh, we knew that that was not the way forward, even though we were successful at that time. And so uh, when it came to 277, uh, in many ways, actually, the parents led. So uh, I think the classic public health thing when I got my MPH was is that uh, first thing you want to do when you want to think about intervention for the community is actually ask the community what they want, right? You know, you don't you don't just go and say, well, I looked at all the data and I looked at all the statistics, and this is your problem, and I'm here to solve it. That doesn't work. You have to go to the community and say, well, what do you feel is the most important issue? What are the things that you're concerned about, and how can I help you solve them? Right. So that's the, and in many ways, that's really how 277 evolved. I think, in fact, I think Clay, you're probably asking me to do a PBE bill before I actually decided to do a PBE <coughs> regulation bill. So. so that actually, uh, is my mic on? I can't tell you. Yeah. Okay. So that actually dovetails on an audience question, and this is for Leah. How is Vaccinate California different from other public health groups? Sure. Um, well, first, just to talk a little bit about the, the first question, what can the public health community do differently? Um, uh, so my father's a physician, which is probably why I am inclined to trust science and medicine. Um, but, and so I, I, I get the, um, the, the desire to stand behind a white coat and a stethoscope. But what I think works when you're communicating about something very personal, like what to inject into your child, um, it's important to speak as a parent yourself, if you are one, or as a grandparent, or as a, uh, an aunt, um, or a community member, and be willing to take off the sort of trappings of medicine and be a human being connecting to another human being. Um, and that's what we did as um, the parent community, which included a lot of members of the medical community, but we encouraged them to speak not just as public health advocates, this is what the public health should be, uh, this is what the standard of care is, but rather, I vaccinated my kids. Um, and so I, you know, I, I would want you to do the best for your child as I do for mine. That kind of communication really helps. Uh, Dr. Pan, uh, with a question. Personal belief exemptions only account for 2 to 3% of our overall under immunized rates, as you know. Um, and then there's this question about conditional entrance. So there's no follow up. People say, come to school and say, I'm, I'm going to vaccinate my child. Um, what about, and we saw that there are a lot of kids that are coming to school that way. So what, what to do about that? So Potential new legislation, this question. Well, well, first of all, I would say is that uh, in terms of the uh, people will cite and say, look, the state of California, our overall vaccination rate is okay. It's not great, it's okay. But the issue is that we have pockets, right? And the problem is that those pockets are where an outbreak get, picks up their steam. What you saw, actually, when they analyzed the pertussis outbreak in 2010, an analysis of the measles outbreak in 2015 showed that where the out, how the outbreak spread, it spread from pocket to pocket, essentially. And that's, that's how it got steam and got going. And so when we're talking about uh, the PVE rates and so forth, it's not the PVE rate for the whole state. It's the PVE rate in particular communities and what the overall immunization rate. And don't forget, there's a certain percentage of people who can't get vaccinated. So that's part of the group. And they can't be, so we're never going to get that, we should never get that percentage, never going to get vaccinated because it's not safe for them. And so when you add the PD to that group, then that's when the point, and there's a large number in that community, that's when you drop down to them. As far as, I mean, I think what we're going to see is let's see what happens when we implement 277, right? Let's see. Um, I th again, the goal is not to try to get every child vaccinated who can get a vaccine. The goal is to restore that community immunity. And that, that's really what um, we're, the goal of the bill is. That's a public policy goal. Um, we want to be sure that when people are going about the community with their children, with their parents and grandparents, uh, people may be vulnerable to vaccine preventable diseases, that they don't have to worry that someone's going to be exposed and get sick doing their shopping, dropping their kids off at school, riding on public transportation. 
And so that's the goal, and we're going to continue to look at, if we're not at that goal, what can we do next to help really nudge people along. We're not interested in trying to get, you know, uh, we're not interested in forcing people to do things. We're interested in being sure we protect our community. Renee, um, as a, so this person asks, as a, it sounds like, he or she is a public health researcher scientist. How do I get involved in advocacy while also pursuing science? I do not have a policy background. Um, I also, you know, I, I don't know if I said how I got involved, but I also have a son who is too young to be vaccinated and music and things happening on, on BART. And, um, so that was, that was kind of my impetus. I think the, and I just, I actually called Mark Leno uh, from San Francisco Psychologist's office and I, I had discovered that there were PBEs in my neighborhood that were, um, I'm sorry, um, preschools in my neighborhood with sub 50% vaccination rates. And I was like, this is nuts. I'm from New York City. We, we don't really, <laughs> this is not as much an issue. There's no PBE out there. So I came out here and this was the first time I heard of PBEs. Um, so I think that, you know, you don't have to necessarily be involved on Twitter, uh, particularly if you are in a position where it's a liability for your career. Uh, but there are ways to get involved by just actually picking up the phone and uh, calling your local representative, finding out if maybe, you know, like I actually called Dr. Pan's office and said, hey, I can probably do some analysis for you. I, like, I, I've got some stuff I've been working on, you might be interested in seeing it. Um, and you want to get involved digitally, though. Twitter is really, you know, it's an easy way to go search that hashtag, Tweety Trish, and start there. Um, there's a bunch of science bloggers who are uh, active also. I think, um, I don't recall, and maybe Liz knows the kind of science blogging hashtags that are active, but you can go in there and find uh, people who you are interested in, follow them, connect with them online. And people are remarkably open to having people reach out to them and just ask to connect. So, so there's a question here, Leah. Um, the, the, I, I, I think you addressed this, but I think it's worth repeating. When supporting a public health campaign, how much effort resources are allocated towards countering opposition versus promoting your own message? But you were pretty clear on stay positive. Yeah, so for us, um, we, we sort of, because we were part of this big coalition um, with the other groups in Sacramento, we could really figure out where our effort was best spent. And as the parent voice, that was our piece of the pie. So as the parent voice, our job really was to show legislators why they should vote for the bill. It wasn't to convince people who were against the bill that they were wrong, but rather give them the positive reason why to vote for the bill. And so to put kids like Gideon in front of them um, and put parents like me who want the bill to pass in front of them. Uh, and we left the refutation of um, the conspiracy theories to the MDs um, and to other people um, who were already doing that, people already out there in the immunization advocacy space. Um, there's like the Tweety Attritions. They were out there doing that for us, so we didn't have to. A uh, question here that, that comes up very, very often when I was reporting on vaccines is, uh, this is the most, I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit, uh, it's, the, it's the most vaccines, the greatest number of vaccines we've, uh, that the CDC, that the state recommends that children get. Um, at what point is enough enough? Should we accept every new vaccine or just, and just keep adding them? Where do you recommend we draw the line, Dr. Tan? Can our kids, and this is the central question, can our kids really accommodate this many inoculations year after year? So I would say, isn't that wonderful? We can prevent so many diseases. RSV. Anyone, anyone see a child with RSV, bronchitis in the hospital, ICU, children die? Someone's developing a vaccine for that. Looks like there's a, there's, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a vaccine for RSV? I mean, that, uh, people, actually, I know some of the opposition was, was on, on social media talking about, well, antibiotic resistance, why are we doing something about that? Well, actually, if we could do something about it, we have a vaccine for those diseases, right? I mean, that, then we wouldn't need antibiotics. We'd have a vaccine, and we could prevent them and not actually have people treated, have need the antibiotic treatment. And so when, we, when people talk about, you know, uh, so one of the things that the, uh, the people are concerned about vaccines would say is that, well, there are too many antigens, right? Because that's really what you're talking well, about. Can you explain what you mean by that, please? So, so antigens are the sort of the proteins or particles that, that the body might react to that's actually in the vaccine, right? And in fact, actually, because of improving vaccine technology, the actual number of antigens that children are getting in vaccines has been declining over time, even as we're preventing more diseases. So when people say, well, why about we have another vaccine for another disease? And, and I'll tell you that, actually, 
Um, right now, there are certainly many vaccines that are not recommended to be received by children in the United States, right? Uh, there, there may be in other countries because the, so the public health officials, you know, in, a, in the ACIP and CDC, it's not that every single vaccine that comes along, they said everybody in the United States should get that vaccine. In fact, we look at what are the diseases people are most at risk for. And in fact, actually, uh, if we're successful in actually vaccinating enough people around the world, we no longer have to give that vaccine, smallpox. <laughs> the only people who get smallpox vaccine is the military because the military has decided they want, they want to avoid it being potential biological warfare weapon, right? But otherwise, no one here is getting smallpox vaccine. Actually, I had a family that didn't believe in vaccines who were demanding smallpox vaccine <laughs> because they heard, read a news story saying that terrorists were going to you know, get hold of the, the disease. Uh, I said there hasn't been a case yet. Um, hopefully polio will be a vaccine that will no longer need to be given because we've actually eradicated it from the globe. We're almost there. We are almost there. And so as you can see the sequence of events, get a vaccine, start clearing the disease, eliminate the disease, we can stop the vaccine. Um, so I actually think, and as a pediatrician, actually several vaccines came into being during my career as a pediatrician. And I saw with each one of those, I saw patients that were in the hospital before and didn't see them anymore. They started disappearing. And isn't that a wonderful thing? That we don't have children in the hospital with diseases, that we don't have people coming down with cancer because we have a vaccine that's gonna help protect someone, even one that's imperfect. And, that yet, and yet, here's another question, we do have, um, we have a vaccine court that was established yes. to protect people. There are children who are harmed by vaccines. So, so what I would say is, is that the vaccines consistently been many fold safer than the diseases they prevent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? At a population level. At the population level, right? I mean, there's nothing that's 100% safe. In fact, actually, people talk about why are vaccines, right? They say, oh, I'm worried about formaldehyde, I'm worried about aluminum. Thimerosal uh, is not in childhood vaccines. People say they're worried about thimerosal. You know what's the most dangerous substance in the vaccine? Water. More children die of water toxicity than anything else that's in the vaccine. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Oh, more children die of drowning. Ah. I say it's the second leading cause of death in children that's between two and five, so sort of vaccine age. But yet we're not worried about water because we know that those matters, right? They're not going to drown from an injection. Is it possible that water is so, causing autism? So, so, you know, I, I think that when you come down... So again, I, you know, we, 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 one of the things we need to do is public health, you know, uh, in the public health field, is that is actually educate people about relative risks, right? I mean, that is something that we have not done a very good job at. So, so often people will say, look, there's something in X, and it's, and to, to look at what are the relative risks. In fact, it's actually more dangerous uh, to get in the car and drive to wherever you're going to get your vaccine than the vaccine itself. But clearly, the diseases are much more dangerous. In fact, the, the challenge is that vaccines are so successful because they've sort of eliminated the disease in the immediate area that people don't realize that they don't know the danger of the disease anymore. That's why when we originally passed the laws, you didn't have any problem. When, when, poly, when it's all commands the polio vaccine, not only were bells ringing everywhere, there were huge lines. No one was going and saying, hey, don't give me that vaccine. They're all standing in long lines because they saw the paralysis and the deaths. So this is also, this is a question that's come up that I, I actually haven't looked really closely at, but I'm also curious about. And I don't know if you would have any, I, I'm sure Dr. Pam will have something to say, but there seem to be a lot of questions regarding medical exemptions and special education students. Um, I'm just going to read this because uh, Bob Sears has been using his status as well as his, uh, this person puts it in quotation marks, immunity education Facebook page to spread this, what is special education's role in SB 277, and is there any truth to perceive loopholes, that was it, via special education? So again, remember, we had uh, 
as we were going through the policy process, we wanted to be sure we store community immunity. That was the main goal of the bill. Also, another shared value was that we ensure every child in the state of California had access to an education. Right. And so in regards to special education, so what we said is if you didn't vaccinate your child, you need to homeschool, or you can do independent study through public schools. So therefore, people concerned about financial barriers, you can use the public school system. Now, when it comes to special education, what we decided, because after all, the child needs special ed needs, basically that their vaccination status should not affect their ability to get special education services. I think that's a reasonable thing to say. It doesn't mean that every child who gets special ed can just go walk into school. It's that they can get their special education service to do it. Do they go to another center to do it at the school district's expense? Do they come on campus for the time they actually need the spe specific special ed services that are in their IEP? <coughs> Not like, oh, I can go to school and they're everything else. It is specifically for special ed services that are specifically specified in their individualized education plan. And uh, I believe we're working out the regulations on that. And again, it's about trying to be sure we achieve a sufficiently high immunization rates in our schools to protect communities. So you know, it's, this is all about, again, it's about relative risk, right? So what happens is that if you have a couple of unvaccinated kids who are showing up on campus once a week to get their speech therapy, how much of a risk does that pose? You know, versus you have an accumulating number of people who are there on campus all the time. Yes, it's a slightly increased risk, but we think, again, that we're trying to be sure that those children have access to their education, because that, again, is a shared value. We want to be sure every child, we do not want the parents to be able to deny their child education because they made a misinformed choice about vaccines. So and this, is, this is gonna be your last question. Um, we talked a lot about the uh, medical exemption. Somebody's asking how can we provide oversight on medical exemptions, and I don't know, does that involve your organization at all? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll just speak up. Uh, no, it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily involve us, but it involves us to the extent that we are still out there educating the community um, and educating parents about what the medical exemption is for. The medical exemption is the reason, you know, people who need that, that's the reason why we need this bill. Right. And so explaining that, community immunity can handle a few people not being vaccinated. It can't handle bazillions of people not being vaccinated. Then we lose the protection for people like you who need it the most. Yeah, 85% of the adults in this country are not vaccinated. And you're talking about community immunity just among the children. So, so, it doesn't uh, make I any sense. Right, right. So, we're now out of time. Unfortunately, I want to uh, offer that uh, we're here at School of Public Health. The data is out there on rates of immunizations uh, when those people stood in line. Well, what do you have planned uh, for so adults? Therefore, well, we know that uh, those people are vaccinated. And that's why we were able to eliminate measles in 2000. Let's not have it come back. Thank you very much.